Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. We are rocketing into the 17th century today. Alina, why? Who have you brought with you? We have with us Linda Porter, who's a historian. She's written many, many, many books. Uh, but her most recent book is called Mistresses, Sex and Scandal at the Court of Charles II. And today we're going to be talking about this incredibly, incredible topic. Brilliant. Welcome. Now now I know why you were so excited, because the word sex and scandal come up. Hello, Linda. Hello, Alex. Yes, it, it does. Um, I would have to, to admit it does help sell books. Yeah, absolutely. And in a time when everybody's releasing theirs at exactly the same time, you need a hook, don't you? Well, in fact, in that respect, I was rather fortunate um, because my book came out back in April at the height of lockdown when many others were being either shelved for a year or at least for six months. Mm. And so it got quite a lot of attention and reviews in the press. Whereas I think if it had been put back into the autumn where we are now, you know, there has been an absolute tsunami of books coming out, as you know. And I think it might not have got the attention it did back in the spring. So it is a kind of double-edged, double-edged sword. In a well, way. I'm glad you weren't swallowed up in that huge, yeah, uh, or was it about 600 in a week, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I've got yeah. to say, your book does deserve the attention because I've read it, I loved it, I couldn't put it down, and I'm sorry to all our other guests. That is the reason why I'm running late with everyone else's <laughs> prep work, because I couldn't put this one down. Oh, just as well it's not any longer in that case, Alina, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we know that our pub regular, Charlie White, is out there bouncing up and down on her sofa listening to this, or in her office, um, because she's really excited to hear from you. So I guess so. let's start, because we have a lot of listeners in America, um, so let's start with the basics. First of all, can you just briefly tell everyone who Charles II was and how he ended up in exile and we'll set the scene? Yes, of course. Uh, Charles II was the eldest surviving son and eldest surviving child of um, Charles I and Henrietta Maria. His parents had an an absolutely wonderful and extremely close marriage um, uh, and set him an example which he was absolutely to disregard totally in his own personal life. Uh, But he was born in 1630. Um, The Queen had had one pregnancy before, but the child had died the same day that it had been born. But Charles II was healthy uh, and he was a large baby and very dark in colouring like his French ancestors on the uh, Bourbon side. In fact, his his mother found this rather embarrassing um, uh, and wished that he he didn't look quite as... um, quite as dark as he did, uh, but he did thrive. So there doesn't seem to have been any um, particular ill health or, or danger to, to his life, which was reasonably unusual for children at that time. And in, in a royal family, you could expect to, to lose a few just statistically. So he survived. Uh, and I suppose the most crucial event that shaped him was the outbreak of the uh, civil wars, the, the wars of the three kingdoms, as they should properly be known. They're often known as the English Civil Wars, but they took place in Ireland and Scotland uh, and indeed in Wales as well. So uh, historians call them the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. And and this came when Charles was 12, Charles II was 12 years old. And it, it effectively curtailed his childhood and more importantly, his education. He was definitely not an unintelligent man, but he wasn't by any stretch of the imagination an intellectual He wasn't interested in ideas. He wasn't interested in learning. His governor, the Duke of Newcastle, his, in other words, his his sort of personal guardian and tutor, had brought him up to think that, you know, real men and real kings spent a lot of time hunting, shooting and possibly fishing. I'm not quite so sure about that. But Charles did eventually love to sail. He was hugely keen on yachting, um, which makes him rather unusual as an English monarch. He didn't get much chance to do any of that during the Civil War. And eventually in 1646, as the royalist cause was obviously faltering and stuttering to a halt, uh, it was decided that he had to leave the, the English mainland for his own safety. His father was then effectively a prisoner of the Scots and later of the English army. Uh, and so as the, the son and heir 
he was sent first to the Channel Islands, to Jersey, uh, which he seems to have rather enjoyed. And that's probably there, incidentally, that he, he started sailing um, because it's a natural thing to do on somewhere like the island of Jersey. Yeah, we had a brief segue with uh, David Davis when he was on that, where we learned that sort of Charles was quite instrumental in naval matters, wasn't he, in driving? Yes, it? yes, he was, mm. yes. Um, and many English and, and indeed Scottish kings were interested in naval matters, but for, for Charles... Sailing was a sort of personal obsession, and I've always thought it perhaps is the key to understanding him, because it's the only time that he could get away with people and be completely free and in charge of his own destiny. And I think it's quite a powerful metaphor for the man he became and, and the life that he led. But anyhow, um, from from Jersey, he was um, moved off to France to be with his mother, Henrietta Maria, who'd escaped there some years before. Uh, and, and so effectively at that point of time, he ends up in exile at the court of his younger cousin, Louis XIV, where he and his mother and his much younger sister, um, Princess Henrietta, and eventually James, the future James II, the Duke of York, who would join them within a year or so, uh, they, they are effectively the poor relations. Because, you know, if you're uh, even a young king, as Louis was, in charge of what you want to be uh, the defining monarchy in Europe. It's a bit embarrassing to have uh, penniless cousins around who've been kicked out of their own country. Uh, there was money given to Henrietta Maria to support her growing number of, of sort of angry and uh, jealous and fighting amongst themselves followers. But it, it was a, a life where... Um, uh, even if you had security of where you were living, you were constantly patronised by those around you. And often that security was fairly short-lived. And as James II himself said later on, there was nothing so rare as money. So that's how um, he ended up in exile. And of course, he was actually at the Hague in the Netherlands because his sister, his sister Mary, who was the nearest to him in birth, was married to the head of the, the House of Orange, the uh, royal family of the Netherlands. Uh, and he had spent Christmas of uh, 1648 there. Um, and and the, the siblings were obviously in fear of what was going to happen to their father, Charles I, because they knew that he was on trial um, and that he was being tried for treason. And although I, I think even most of Europe would have been incredulous at that point, uh, there was... The underlying, if, if sort of totally unacceptable fear that he might be executed. And as we know, he was at the end of January 1649, mm -hmm. uh, when Charles was still in The Hague. Uh, and it was there that he learned, um, from his, his religious advisor, his, his almoner, uh, that he was King of England. Um, and apparently, if contemporary reports are going to be believed, he burst into tears. Which I suppose is a not unnatural reaction if you're just 18 and, and you've lost a father for whom you undoubtedly had a genuine affection. So that, that was the, the start of, of um, he was in fact in exile for 13 quite miserable years, starting in, in 1646 and, and ending up uh, not until he returned to, to England in, in 1660. Apparently, that was Melania Trump's reaction to her husband winning the election as well. <laughs> well. In her case, there could be other reasons for yeah, it. Yeah, many, many other reasons. <laughs> yeah. but, but yes, I mean, it, 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 to, to, to Charles, throughout that period of time, wandering mm. through Europe um, uh, as the not entirely welcome guest of, of kings and princes. And he went, he spent a lot of time in Germany. He was in Cologne. Um, he was uh, in Belgium, what is now Belgium, for quite a while, in Brussels, uh, and then in um, Bruges. Uh, so he, he, he spent his time essentially wandering around Europe um, with a group of uh, loyal but but also well, even more penniless than he was courtiers um, and it, it was a strange atmosphere to be in I, I mean he wasn't the sort of young man who really knew or who had the tools perhaps one should say to 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 make the best of that situation he yeah. had all the protocol of a court and a king around him but absolutely none of the substance and the reality and I, I think this marked him for life quite honestly I think you're absolutely right I think it explains so easily and so distinctly perhaps his later excesses as well yeah and sort of a, a lack of ability to curb them 
Yes, I, I. But of course, as we know, while he was in exile, he didn't just sit around moping. Um, he got involved with quite a lot of young ladies, which I think mm-hmm. leads to your next question. <laughs> yes, I was actually going to say that you made a very brief comment earlier that I suggest there is some sort of truth to the next question. Uh, so while he was exiled, he apparently had many lovers. Um, you mentioned about this in your book. So is it true or is it more about Cromwellian propaganda? No, I don't think it. I mean, obviously, it was a godsend to Cromwellian propaganda, uh, um, something which Charles's advisers tried to remind him constantly, but he took no notice of. I mean, th- there were a number of mistresses. The, the first was Lucy Walter. And there may have been other women before that. I mean, there are, there are rumours about women that he was involved with as a very young man on the island of Jersey, but those can't be substantiated. The first known mistress, the, officially, as it were, in inverted commas, and the first with whom he had a child was um, Lucy Walter, uh, who was a, a Welsh girl who had, like a number of others um, who were, pretty but ill-educated and looking um, to be supported themselves financially, she had taken herself off to the, um, uh, to the Netherlands uh, to, to essentially find a lover uh, amongst the royalists who, who would support her there. Uh, and she'd been quite successful with this before, she, uh, before Charles ever encountered her. And there, I mean, she was... I, I mean, I, I, you will perhaps be amused to know that before my book came out and my publisher was debating sort of what to put online about it, I had written a little sort of pen portrait of each of the mistresses and I described Lucy Walter as a good time girl. And they said, oh, you can't say that. You'll get lots of abuse on Twitter. So I went, what? Because actually, for God's sake, Lucy Walter was a good time girl. And I think she would have been the first to tell you that, probably. I think there's such a danger now of overdoing it, isn't there? I mean, she undoubtedly used, in a a difficult time, to be a woman without means and without family. Yes, yes. That's what she had to do, and she was good at it. Yes, she was good at it. And she was doing it as well. There's nothing bad with saying that. No, I don't think so either. And uh, she, uh, I haven't had any, well, maybe I will after this, perhaps I'm inviting it. But I haven't had a, a single tweet um, re- reproving me for this description. I mean, it, it, it does actually fit in, in a way, with our view of, of how women took responsibility for their own future. Um, it may be viewed as immoral by some people, but like you said, it was just a reality of the, the way they had to get along. And Lucy was a, a rather buxom beauty with, with lots of sort of dark chestnut hair. She and Charles were the same age, um, both 18, and they seem to have had an extremely brief liaison, which had very long consequences. In fact, consequences that would last for the rest of Charles's life, quite literally. Um, because the liaison um, did result in a son. Um, Charles would have known when his father's execution news came through that he was going to be a father himself fairly soon. So Lucy gave birth at the, in the spring of, of uh, 1614 and to uh, a son she called James. Um, uh, and for a while, he didn't even have a surname as such. I mean, eventually he was known as, as um, uh, James Scott, which was the, the uh, uh, surname that he was given when he married into the, the Scottish aristocracy much later on. Uh, the child stayed with her for a while. Um, she seems to have been a, a, a not entirely dutiful mama. I mean, she knew what a... Uh, prize the son was and how he could be used as a bargaining chip but she wasn't terribly effective at doing this I mean Lucy was a person whose heart and temper uh, always ruled her head Uh, and the problem was of course that Charles really didn't have very much money to hand to support this boy anyhow so Lucy and little James ended up with very little financial support and she began to behave more and more outrageously to the um a uh, great uh, uh, concern of Charles's advisers because they knew that this was meat and drink for the Cromwellian regime in, in London. You know, not only is this man a steward and unfit to rule, but he's got this perfectly useless mistress who keeps on making a fool of herself in public. Uh, she ended up in the Tower of London for a while when she rather unwisely came back to England, uh, ostensibly in pursuit of a legacy that had been left her. But she was thought, I think, to be so kind of um, weird that they, they let her go and she went back to the Netherlands. Eventually, Charles 
had the child kidnapped, little James. Um, it's Monmouth, little James. Yes, he is. Ah, Mon- okay. Yes. Now I know what you mean about the yeah, he, he doesn't thing. become Monmouth until very much later mm. on, until his father actually regains the throne. But yes, he is. So, so he had um, the future Duke of Monmouth kidnapped from his mother, um, taken to Paris to be brought up by a, a royalist supporter there, who discovered that although the child was ten, he couldn't count even to five and could barely read and write. Um, education was obviously not one of his <laughs> priorities, uh, but he was a royal child, albeit a royal bastard, and he had to be looked after, you know, as properly as times would um, uh, admit. But um, so, so that's his story. Lucy incidentally died in 1648 in Paris. We don't know of what. Um, she had been left bereft by the loss of her son and had wandered around looking for him. And uh, eventually she became ill. She claimed subsequently that there had been a marriage ceremony between her and Charles II, which he always denied, and for which there is actually no um, evidence that anyone has yet found. And so... Her story um, ends rather early and rather sadly, but there were a few other mistresses at the same time. I mean, Charles had had an affair with her, the daughter of an English royalist called Catherine Pegg. He had two children with her. He had uh, a child with um, Elizabeth Killigrew, who, who was connected actually to a family who were prominent theatre owners later on during the Restoration. Wasn't she the most scandalous one of all? Um, what, Betty Killigrew? Um, yeah. I um, I suppose in, in some respects, she, she was married already, um, but not that that seemed to have been a problem for her or, or Charles. Now, I've always thought that really probably um, in terms of personality and sheer um, uh, force of personality that Barbara Castlemaine was perhaps the most scandalous. But, but Betty Killigrew was, I mean, she did, I think it was rather shocking that she'd had this child while her poor husband had apparently looked on and not been able to do anything about it. And there was also Eleanor Needham, um, who was older than Charles, um, uh, and uh, a very handsome woman, judging by her portraits. She didn't have any children with him, but she was canny enough to make sure he paid her a pension. Um, So she clearly had her business head screwed on, and rather more successfully than poor Lucy Walter had. Um, There may well have been other women, we just don't know. Uh, Marriage for Charles was mooted with... Princess Henrietta Catherine of Orange, another member of the Dutch royal family, um, whom Charles seems to have liked. And she was certainly a fairly attractive girl. Um, but it, the marriage wasn't favoured by her mother. And um, at the time, you know, Charles was still a penniless exile. Uh, she would certainly have given him a lot of children because eventually she produced about more than about nine or ten of her own, I think. Whether the marriage would have succeeded given Charles's um, ability to be so easily tempted, I rather doubt. And I think he would have found in Henrietta Catherine of Orange a, a lady of some metal who would have let him know in no uncertain terms what she thought about this. So perhaps it was just as well the marriage didn't go ahead. But that does bring us back to um, Charles's return to, to England in, in 1660. It does. I, mean, I know all the men are listening to this going, what a boy uh, he was <laughs> indeed. But you cannot get more far removed from some of the women we've been talking about than the poor woman who ended up married to him. She she wasn't as fertile as uh, as the Dutch royal family. And sadly for her, I don't think she had the same metal to sort of control him, did she? So no. tell us about Catherine of Braza- uh, Braganza, uh, daughter of the Portuguese king. And they are married in 1662. So that's two years after the restoration, isn't it? Why did you include her in the mistresses? Well, um, if for no other reason than that she did actually share his bed, of course. Yes. Um, uh, and and, and to, to, to that degree, you know, as a sexual partner, she deserves to be remembered as well as his, his long-suffering wife. I mean, she did have several pregnancies, I think three, if I recall. Um, she seems to have had um, a condition um, which I don't think is diagnosed as endometriosis, so it sounds a lot like it to me, but it, it's, I mean, I won't go into this in huge detail because mm. a lot of your male visitors will rapidly switch, I mean, rapidly switch off. Um, but but she, she had a condition which meant that she had very frequent and heavy periods, and apparently this condition predisposes women to miscarriages. And certainly poor Catherine of Braganza did have three uh, miscarriages before she and Charles evidently decided just to give up on the idea that, that she would ever produce an heir. Uh, but no, you're right to point out he'd been back in the, in England for two years before he married. 
Uh, he wasn't in any great rush to marry. Indeed, why would he be when he had the voluptuous uh, Barbara Villiers, Lady Castlemaine, um, uh, constantly in his bed and producing children at a, at a rate of knots, though all illegitimate, of course, um, while at the same time being married to her, her own uh, I think actually rather handsome, more handsome than Charles II husband, um, Roger Palmer, uh, who was made Earl of Castlemaine, said that she could have a title. Uh, and and uh, Charles wasn't in any hurry to marry. And of course, it was quite imperative that he married someone who would bring a dowry. And Catherine of Braganza, um, though um, uh, only the, the second generation of a new dynasty in Portugal, because Portugal's relationship with Spain had had been um, difficult for, for centuries. You know, this goes back into the high Middle Ages. Sometimes it's a separate country, sometimes it's not. But um, before Catherine's birth, the Portuguese nobles had revolted against the rule of um, uh, Philip II of Spain uh, and had set up John of Braganza, who was from a branch of the old royal ruling family, uh, as their king. And so Catherine came to Charles with the uh, most uh, astonishingly huge dowry of any uh, English queen consort. And that, I'm afraid, was the poor woman's attraction primarily. I mean, not only did she bring loads of actual money, uh, (coughs) but she brought um, Bombay, Brazil and a lot of the eastern um, uh, areas of the world that had been ruled by Portugal as a colonial power. So um, she brought enormous wealth with her, uh, which was very attractive for a king who was always skint. Mm. Was it it, um, Shirley Henderson that played her? Yes, it I was. I thought she was brilliant. Yeah. I felt so bad for her. I thought she well, did it really well. Catherine, however, has, has often been dismissed as a weepy dope who, mm. uh, you know, uh, rather unwisely fell hopelessly in love with her husband, um, realised that she could never really have a place in his affections and sort of retreated into religiosity. <coughs> I- I really think she deserves her own podcast because I love the way I love the way you write about her. She deserves her own limelight, to be honest. She does. Well, I'll just say a few more words about her. I mean, j- just to, to link us into the, the, the next question. She does deserve a lot more. Um, she managed to cope with what I think most of us would find a totally invidious and insupportable situation quite well. Uh, she did have a a loyal group of, of people in her household, not just her Portuguese ladies who come with her, but, but uh, those who were appointed here in, the, in, in England. Uh, and she, you know, eventually forged a life for herself, separate from her husband. And she, of course, was the only one of all the women he'd ever known who was actually with him on his deathbed, uh, because mistresses weren't allowed in. So, you know, there are some ways in which if you hold out long enough, you can win. Uh, but she, she is an interesting woman, you're right. So Charles had, a, well, quite a few mistresses. Uh, some are obviously quite well known. However, we're going to talk about some of the lesser known mistresses. And we're going to start with Frances Theresa Stewart, his third mistress. So can you tell us a bit about her? Well, uh, the interesting thing about Frances Theresa Stewart is that probably she was never in the actual physical sense Charles's mistress. He claimed that he had finally seduced her after she married, um, but she disputed this. And certainly she'd spent... Um, the period between sort of 1662 and 1667, five years um, uh, fighting off his advances. He was absolutely obsessed with her, even while, you know, still producing children almost on an annual basis with uh, uh, Barbara Castlemaine. Frances Theresa Stewart was the daughter of a, uh, a Scottish royalist who, like many other royalists, had gone to uh, Paris to... Uh, uh, see what he could get out of the court of Henrietta Maria, and uh, taking with him his wife, who who was a she was widowed. She'd been married once before and had an uh, an older son, but he stayed in the in in England. Uh, and while they lived there, they had two children, Sophia and Francis Teresa. So Francis was brought up as a Catholic um, in the court of Louis the Fourteenth, uh, and for a while was as a very young girl was in the household of. Um, Princess Henrietta Stuart, the the Duchess of Orléans, who was married to Louis XIV's ghastly brother. Uh, 
Um, and, and there is a story that would take several podcasts to go through, but <laughs> that, that would have to be for another time, I think. I mean, it, it, it is like Versailles, only, you know, the reality in some respects is even worse. But um, that's how uh, Frances Stewart grew up. Uh, and um, when she reached the age of about 15, uh, Princess Henrietta Stuart, the Duchess of Orléans, uh, decided that, you know, perhaps this girl would have a brighter future uh, over in England with her brother. Uh, and sent him a note saying, you know, I'm, I'm sending you this girl to adorn your court. She is the prettiest girl in the world. Um, which, given the fact that um, Princess Henrietta did know her brother's proclivities rather well, w- was perhaps not the um, not the best way of alerting him. You know, his antennae must have been uh, working, if not some other parts of him, uh, <laughs> even, even before she arrived. Um, so Julie, she did arrive and, and was there to serve in as a maid of honour to um, Catherine of Braganza. She was about 15 years old. She was very pretty in, in a rather what we would think consider vacuous and vapid sort of way, I think. You know, she, she, she had a lot of sort of um, reddish fair hair. Um, she, she undoubtedly was a good looking girl. Um, and those who met her uh, immediately assumed that she was the sort of epitome of a um, teenage airhead. Uh, in fact, there is a great deal more to Frances Stewart than that. And I think one of the things I most enjoyed about writing the book was finding out quite a lot more about her, because at the time she was sort of written off as someone whom Charles obviously lusted hugely after. And um, Barbara Castlemaine attempted to um, control the situation by becoming super friendly with Frances Stewart, you know, almost in a kind of older sister way. Uh, but this didn't deter for, uh, Charles from trying to pursue her. And, I mean, there are uh, uh, reports of um, poor uh, Catherine of Braganza hesitantly coming into her husband's um, rooms early in the morning and finding him uh, with Francis Stewart on his lap, sort of pawing her. I mean, the, the things these girls had to put up with, people would not put up with nowadays, <laughs> incidentally. So, uh, it's kind of it, that thing that you, you know you can't have you want what you can't have that's the word i was looking yeah, for yeah yeah no, i know i think that's a fair enough way of putting it well uh eventually francis um uh, you know various politicians tried to court her thinking oh good you know another route to the king's ear maybe uh, but she was viewed at the time as someone whose whose beauty absolutely did not match her intellect and she was dismissed as a, a silly giggler who'd laugh at almost any joke at all and spent her time building um, castles made of playing cards. Well, whether this was entirely an act or not, we don't really know. I mean, it, it may have been Francis's way of dealing with a rather different, difficult situation. But certainly by the late 1660s, um, by the time she was approaching the age of 20, uh, she was obviously desperate that she couldn't... Um, offend the king off very much longer um despite his giving her you know lots of jewelry and presents and that sort of thing you know she knew that that she would be uh eventually required to do something in return for this and that's something she seems not to have wanted to do uh so um providentially as it happened the king's cousin whom he couldn't stand uh which was to be a further complication also charles stuart um duke of richmond and lennox um, had recently lost his second wife, um, and uh, he knew Francis Stuart at court, and the two seem to have um, formed a, a, a liaison. Um, and to cut a long story short, towards the end of March 1667, they eloped um, and were married secretly at uh, the Duke of Richmond's home here in, in Kent. Uh, and uh, uh, then tried to creep their way back into court. Well, Charles was absolutely furious. You know, he thought this girl had betrayed him, though she'd never actually been his mistress. Uh, And for a while, they were persona very known grafter at court. Uh, And Richmond, who who, uh, seems to have had an affectionate and successful marriage with Francis, you know, this is an unlikely combination Richmond drank too much, um, he gambled too much, um, 
Uh, he had lands all over England and Scotland and had to travel a good bit. So he left Francis in charge of his business affairs, um, which for someone who was viewed as a giggly airhead building castles of cards, he seems to have managed with extraordinary um, efficiency. Uh, and and this, you know, this this responsibility to her husband brought out an entirely different side of her. Uh, and, and she became a, a, a competent business manager. Um, as I said, the marriage seems to have been affectionate. There were rumours that she was pregnant, but there are no children that survived at any rate. Uh, and things were going quite well for her until her husband was sent um, without her, because quite often wives did not accompany her husbands on diplomatic missions in those days. He was sent up to Denmark as ambassador because Scandinavia was an important diplomatic area for for Britain, and Charles wanted someone there that he may not have liked, but who he could trust. And um, the Duke of Richmond got very bored there, um, continued drinking too much. One night, just before Christmas, he heard that there was a, a British warship in the Sound of Elsinore, and decided he would go out for a visit, and had a rather jolly dinner, and downed several more bottles of wine, um, leaving you know in the freezing cold of a very dark night in December he missed his footing between the boat he was on and the launch that would take him back to land fell into the freezing waters um he was fished out alive uh but obviously the hypothermia and the shock to his system probably exacerbated by his dependence on alcohol uh, he, he died of what seems to have been heart failure before he even got back to his lodgings. I mean, some people find this funny. I can assure you, if you were Francis Theresa Stewart, you would not have found it funny. It, it is a bizarre way to go, I, admittedly, but I, I don't think it is an amusing incident as such. Uh, and so Francis was left a widow and spent many years thereafter fighting her sister-in-law for control of the estate, for monies that her husband had left her, trying to clear all of his debts, and generally using um, a strength of character and a business acumen, which no one who knew her as a 15-year-old would ever have thought she had. And she survived into the um, early part of the 18th century. She attended Queen Anne's coronation, but she died shortly after that. She had been a loyal um personal servant to um, Catherine of Braganza, of whom she was very fond. Uh, And uh, when she died, Frances Stewart, she left uh, the monies that she she had to be put into the the house in uh, the Scottish borders that had become part of her her husband's um, estates, Lennox Love, um, which I would urge anyone to visit. It is one of the most beautiful houses in southern Scotland. And you can still go there and you can still see her portrait and that of some of Charles's other mistresses and the people of the time. Um, And it is well worth a visit. Outstanding. And the next mistress is... Louise de Carowell, is it? Yes, and Louise de Carowell, yes. Yeah, <laughs> in, from memory, this one really, really um, vexes Barbara Villiers, doesn't it? Well, Barbara's day was more or less done by the time mm. that Louise de Carowell um, became um, Charles's mistress. Um, the person who really uh, vexed Louise de Carowell and, and who she vexed back in return was Nell Gwynne, actually. I mean, we haven't said anything about Nell Gwynne, and the reason I haven't is that she's the most well-known of Charles's mistresses, but, you know, it, it's nice to talk about some of the others who are not so well-known. And also, Nell was perhaps one of the least significant politically, whereas Louise de Carouel, um, whose name was remorselessly anglicised as Mrs Carwell by her English detractors, um, uh, at least thought she had a great deal of political influence. Uh, it, it, it is a moot question whether any of Charles's mistresses actually had much political influence over him uh, in reality, but in a way that misses the point. Um, leading politicians of the time thought they did and certainly thought that Louise did. So this does make her an important figure, if not necessarily for... Uh, the reasons and the effects that she might have have liked. Uh, But she was from Brittany, um, uh, uh, the daughter of a a minor Breton nobleman and his wife. Um, We don't know much about her background. Um, She was apparently convent educated. She too had been in the household of Princess Henrietta Stuart. And when um, Henrietta died um, in 1670, 
um, very suddenly, um, apparently of peritonitis. I mean, uh, at the time it was rumoured she'd been poisoned, but a, a post-mortem showed that, that she hadn't, in fact. Um, this, this left um, Henrietta's ladies um, without employment. And Charles II had promised to, to take some of them uh, and bring them over to, to England. Um, uh, Louise de Carouac wasn't the only one, incidentally, but she was certainly the prettiest. Um, because as a young woman, she was very pretty. I mean, she, she had this baby face surrounded by uh, lots of sort of chestnut coloured curls uh, and a very voluptuous figure. Uh, and because she'd been trained at court, um, though she's never struck me as being a very charming person, she obviously struck Charles that way. Um, and he was smitten with her almost the moment that he saw her. Uh, eventually, he managed to seduce her uh, with the help of Lord Arlington, one of his ministers. This is all rather um, distasteful, I suppose. Sinister, it's, isn't it, a little bit? It, it is, yes. It's just a bit yucky mm. <laughs> to, to use a, a, a modern child. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is. It does leave a rather bad taste in your mouth because Louise was a virgin uh, and she knew what was you know, going to happen to her as the result of this. Um, and she decided, well, you know, this is it. I'm, I'm not going to be marriageable. The king seems very fond of me. I will make absolutely the best of it. And I won't have constant rows with him like um, Barbara Castlemaine, who by that time had gone to France herself, actually, to live in Paris for a while, um, where she caused further trouble. Uh, but but uh, Louise decided that she would become... Um, the wife in all but name. Um, she would make Charles happy. She would listen to him. She would um, uh, run beautiful soirees for him and, and his courtiers to which, you know, he could lend the ear to people who wanted to speak to him. She would be his his facilitator, uh, if you like, of a, of a more tranquil um, indulgent um, and quite cultured life. You know, she, she patronised a lot of the French artists. She had all the finest musicians, you know, at, at her table was all the There's finest. a lot of consort work that Catherine uh, isn't doing as well. Yes, as... Well, because Charles wouldn't let her primarily. I yeah. mean, well, Catherine would have been more than capable of it, but she wasn't looked to or ever required mm. to give her. So, yes, you're right. It is like concert, um, consort work. And Louise was incredibly good at it. Um, and she did not demand huge amounts of properties and money like um, Barbara Castlemaine had done. She was perfectly content with what was admittedly a, a massive and opulent um, suite of rooms in Whitehall Palace. Um, but there she was and she could be close to the king um, at his sort of ear whenever he needed her. Uh, and she seems to be remarkably good at this. Um, they had just the one son together um, who becomes Duke of Richmond, you know, taking the title that Francis Theresa Stuart's dead husband had, had actually vacated. Uh, and also his um, his lands in, in France, because there's a branch of the Stuart family that goes way, way back into the Middle Ages that had served the French kings and had lands there. So so Louise would become eventually a French landowner um, in in her own right as well. And she grew uh, full of figures, shall we say, with age. Um, she involved herself in as much uh, uh, of the political life as she could. Um, she first of all um, uh, tried to support the Earl of Arlington when she thought he wasn't going anywhere. She moved to the Earl of Danby. I mean, these people are not household names, but they were important politicians at the time. She also got herself involved unsuccessfully in the whole um succession crisis of 1679 to 81, when an attempt was made to put the Duke of Monmouth, we finally got back to him, uh, into the succession in place of James, Duke of York, Charles's brother, who by that time had come out openly as a Catholic convert. Uh, and this caused the greatest political um, crisis of Charles's reign. And he came out of it fairly well. Um, Louise um, sort of got her messages mixed on this and sided first with one lot and then with the other, uh, and eventually sort of had to, to back down. Um, there's even there's the suggestion that Charles used as a kind of stalking horse to see how far support for Monmouth would go. But um, that can't be proven. And Charles, um, for all his personal faults, was completely committed to the legitimacy of dynastic descent. And he never seems to have considered for a moment – 
that the throne should pass to his eldest illegitimate son. He knew his brother James's failings very well. He didn't even particularly like him. Um, the siblings were not close in any sense of affection. He's um, not easy to like, is he? No, he's not. <laughs> though, uh, um, I mean, he's perhaps a more complex man than, than, than people realise, James II. I mean, like, like a lot of people who lost their throne, he, he, he has a bad press. So there is a bit more to him as well. But he's not an easy man to like, no. His second wife, Mary of Modena, I think perhaps is and is, is interesting in her own right, but uh, that she's not our concern here. Uh, so uh, eventually, you know, Charles managed to um, put a, 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 a stopper on this bubbling, um, effervescent uh, revolt. Uh, he managed also to close down Parliament uh, and to live without it uh, for the last few years of his life, probably propped up by the fact that he was being paid a fairly handsome pension by Louis XIV. Because one of the things that's not well known about Charles II is that in 1670, he had effectively sold his country to Louis XIV in return for a pension. Now, it's true he never delivered on any of the things he was supposed to do, namely provide a, a massive military force to support uh, uh, Louis XIV in his wars uh, in Europe, nor did he convert to Catholicism uh, at that stage, Charles II, or um, make the country back into a, a Catholic country. But he happily took um, Louis's money, money, and that's probably what kept him going. And he, he, he seems to have had pretensions almost to rule as an absolutist king, but of course these were cut short by his death in his mid-50s in 1685. Uh, Louise de Keroual, um went back to France after that. If you're a mistress of a dead king, you'd better pop off fairly quickly to somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the one person we haven't talked about is Charles's last mistress, who was also still in England at this time. Yes, so Hortense Mancini. Yes, Hortense Mancini, the uh, born Hortensia Mancini in Rome, um, the one of uh, what are known as the five fair nieces of Cardinal Mazarin, who was the... Uh, uh, political advisor to Louis the Fourteenth during basically all of Louis's um, minority and and some years subsequently, uh, and he he was uh, an Italian um, and he had no children, uh, at least no legitimate children as far as I know, which was probably fairly unusual for a religious person at that time. <laughs> Many cardinals had illegitimate children, though perhaps they not gone in for it quite so much in the 17th century as the 16th. But anyhow, um, Mazarin was determined that, that, you know, his nieces and two nephews would be his legacy. Uh, and so eventually, Hortense Mancini, who had, has perhaps the most interesting life of any of these women, was brought as a seven-year-old um, uh, from Genoa, uh, where she'd been uh, living and, and from Rome earlier, to um, France, spending some time in the south of the country with an older sister who was already married to a French nobleman, learning French, learning French manners, because Mazarin knew he wasn't popular, uh, and he was afraid that, you know, the French court, which was well known for being extremely nasty and backstabbing, if it could be, would make fun of his nieces if, you know, they didn't know how to behave and how to talk. Um, however, the nieces were helped by all being exceptionally beautiful, which they really were. I mean, sometimes, as you know, in the past, um, anyone connected with royalty is deemed to be beautiful. And we look at their portraits and think, good God. <laughs> 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 but, you know, in, in, in this case, it is true. I, I mean, she, she is a lovely looking woman, Hortense Mancini. Uh, and uh, as a 14 year old, she was married off. Um, her sisters were all married off in turn. Um, uh, Mazarin tried to make as good marriages for them as he could, but in this case, he really let the poor woman, she was only a girl still, of course, down, because he, he married her um, to a French nobleman, uh, Armand de la Meilleraie, uh, who was already rather strange in his behaviour by then and would go on to become, well, for want of a better term, a complete nutter, I mean, a, a religious obsessive um, and a, a, a total sexual prude. And he, he was determined that, that uh, his wife would have no life of her own. Through several pregnancies, he made her follow her, him around all over France, um, despite the difficulties she encountered, um, because he, he had responsibilities as governor in various areas of France in both the West and the South. 
um, he took all her jewels and, and everything else that she owned on the grounds, which was true legally at the time, of course, that a wife has no property of her own. Um, he more or less shut her up um, in, in the Palais Massacin in, in France. And eventually um, she was so desperate that with the help of her brother and one of her sisters, she actually managed to escape. Uh, and she she managed to go over the French border into Switzerland and finally into Italy, where she eventually joined her sister, Marie Mancini, who had been the first love of Louis XIV. Uh, these were striking young women, to say the least. Uh, and uh, for, for some years, Hortense wandered around Europe. She actually wrote a memoir called The Wandering Life I Led, uh, until uh, eventually her... Um, uh, she'd been supported by the Duke of Savoy. They didn't have a sexual relationship, but she she had ended up in, in Savoy and, and had to leave when he died. And she received quite opportunely um, an invitation from Charles II, but originating at the behest of um, the former British ambassador to uh, to Paris, um, that that she be uh, that she might like to come to England for a while. And having nowhere else to go, she did, and she arrived. Oh, shortly after Christmas in about 1671, 72, after a dreadful crossing. And she was already well known then for her extravagant and extrovert personality, um, for the way she dressed, um, for her um, dislike of all convention, basically. And, and you know, she, she was thought to be quite an interesting woman in England. And Charles had actually asked to marry her years ago when he was in exile in Paris. And, and, and Mazarin had rather pointedly turned him down. Um, he wasn't going to marry off one of his nieces to a, a penniless ex-king at the time. So by that time, of course, such things were too late. They do seem to have had a brief affair. Um, uh, which, which they were quite discreet about, unusually for Charles, and unusually for Hortense, who wasn't renowned for her discretion. Um, she settled in England. Um, she had already had um, a couple of, of same-sex relationships, as far as we know, and she seems to have had one with Barbara Palmer's, uh, Barbara Castlemaine's eldest daughter. I um, mean, it's interesting how all these people go round and round. You know, they, they do occupy a small space in society. Mm. Rather like the current aristocracy, I suppose. Um, but, but, but they do. Um, and I'm not sure that's something that people fully understand. Um, but, but they, they, they are all part of the same network, if, if you like to, to use a modern term. And one day these, these two ladies, Anne Palmer, who was unhappily married and, and, um, uh, uh, Hortense Mancini went out in their night clothes to practice fencing in St. James's Park. Um, this caused quite a stir, as you can imagine. It's quite typical of the sort of woman that Hortense was. She simply did not care about convention. Uh, finally, she became the muse of an exiled um, French intellectual, um, uh, the, the Chevalier saint Um and she, she had a salon of her own, um, which, which, you know, by, by the late 17th century, salons of important women who want to be, you know, considered influencers in society are becoming more common and would become even more so in the 18th century. And there are a number of French exiles and English intellectuals met. And, and eventually um, uh, she, she settled quietly. Um, she seems to have drunk far too much because her... Her bill for gin, um, which is um, in Boughton Court in Northamptonshire, I was very lucky that, that the Duke of Buccleuse, um archivist there brought, brought this to my attention, um, which, which had to be settled after her death because she died in debt, um, it is absolutely huge. Um, it's about £300, which is a, a lot of money for gin in that It sounds like my kind of work. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid that too much of this alcohol might have um, contributed to her fairly early demise. But, but she, she had the most dramatic life, um, uh, up, uproarious, um, cocking a snook at convention all over Europe. Whether it was happy in the end, I think is another matter. And although she's often viewed as a, a you know, a, a sort of early feminist, You've got to understand that what happened to her happened to her because of the male dominated patriarchal society in which she lived. Now, she managed to to deal with it in, in a way that we find impressive and endearing. But, I, you know, whether she would have preferred uh, something quite less colourful, I don't really know.
Mm. We've mentioned um, Monmouth, but uh, he is literally chucking out kids with everyone. How many? Yeah. What's the the most accurate count on well, children, I, I, and which others are his legacy? Um, I think that it's often said that Charles had 14 illegitimate children, but that counts um, the youngest child of Barbara Castlemaine, who was also called Barbara, who most historians believe was actually fathered by John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough. And this may give you another insight into Marlborough, who's one of our great military heroes. Uh, He was much younger than Barbara Castlemaine at the time, but um, it is generally accepted that he was... um, he didn't acknowledge the child incidentally, but it's generally accepted that, that, that he was her father. So that makes 13 um, by, you know, a, a number of different women. The most by um, Barbara Castlemaine, with whom he had five, um, three sons and two daughters. Um, then there are the um, ones that he'd already had in exile, of whom there are a good sort of one, two, three, well, four at least. Um, uh, and there are... Um, the, 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 the Duke of Richmond with uh, Louise de Carroal, um two sons with Nell Gwyn, um, one of whom survived and became Duke of Albans, and, and you know, the, the line still exists. Um, probably some others with other ladies of the court that we don't um, necessarily know about. There were no children with Francis Stuart, which leads one to suppose they never did actually have, have sex together, despite child. It looks like anyone who did ended up with a with a yes, child, it so it would be and, odd. And, and at least one of them, namely poor Louise de Carroel, ended up with a sexually transmitted disease as well. Um, oh, charming. <laughs> well, Charles was dosing himself with, he was interested in medical things, he was dosing himself with mercury for quite a lot of the latter part of his life. In fact, it may have contributed to his fairly early death. Um, Louise was very ill for a while, um, but got over it and, of course, lived for 50 years after him. So she must have been one tough old girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, really? thank you so much for coming on to talk to us more about Charles II. I, he undoubtedly, as well as his actual crown, deserves the crown of the randiest man to ever sit on the British throne. I think that's probably true. Yeah, I, but I, I quite like it about him. I think because as well, like you say, he was no oil painting and just nothing seems to have slowed him down, does it? No, that's perfectly true. <laughs> Tell everyone again uh, what the book is called and where they can get hold of it. Um, the, the book is called Mistresses, uh, Sex and Scandal at the Court of Charles II. Um, I would um, exhort you, if you possibly can, to get hold of it through your local bookseller because these... Um, Local bookshops have suffered terribly, as as you know, Alina and Alex, during mm. the uh, earlier part of lockdown. Um, you can, of course, get it on Amazon. You can get it um, from any of the other sort of major suppliers like Waterstones. Um, or you can even get it directly from my publisher, Picador, which is part of Macmillan. Um, so uh, that that's, that's how you can get it. But... Um, uh, although they don't sell in their bucket loads through individual individual booksellers, I I'm, I would like to make a plea. Um, if you've got, you know, if you live in a smallish town and you've got a bookseller who's struggling, do try and support them. Yeah, absolutely. We always say use them or lose them. Absolutely. Join us tomorrow when Peter Stothard will be with us to talk all about his latest book, The Last Assassin, The Hunt for the Killers of Julius Caesar. It's a fantastic interview, so don't miss it. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe. Don't forget, you can become a patron of History Hack for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to www.historyhack.podbean.com. It will help us keep going in the aftermath of the coronavirus and we would really appreciate it as we would love to do so.